Matthew chapter 20, very familiar passage, verses 18 through 20. And then we're going to highlight, mention a few other passages, a few other verses. We're going to kind of be on like a kind of a short series uh, just for the next uh, few weeks or so. Talk a little bit about, you know, what is the gospel? What does it mean to be uh, a witness? And those are some of the things we're going to talk about today. And uh, why, why are we here? Why is Vintage Church here? Why are we here? Why are you here? What is our purpose? You know, what, you know, what is our calling? What, what, what is it all about? What, you know, this Christian life, why, why are we still here? Um, you know, why is it that after we come to know Christ, he leaves us here? I don't know about you, but I, I'll be honest. I wish that the day I accepted Jesus, he's like, all right, you're in. Let's go. And you just went to heaven, right? But there is a reason, there is a purpose, there is a plan for each of us. And so we're going to be talking about those type of things for the next few weeks. And so let's kind of get started this week. Matthew 28, 18 through 20. Jesus, he came and he spake to them saying, this is his disciples. Now remember, these are the last words of Christ. But notice he says, all power or all authority, he says, all authority is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go therefore... He says, teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Teach them to obey all things, whatever I have commanded you. And he says, I am with you always. I'm always with you, even unto the end of the age. Let's pray. Lord, have you ever heard of the Great Commission? The Great Commission. Jesus gives what's called the Great Commission here in Matthew chapter 28. These are the last words of Christ. Now, each of the Gospels gives us kind of a, a different wording, but in different ways, we're given the Great Commission. Someone once said this, that for the New Testament church, it's not the Great Commission. It has become the Great Omission. And that's kind of a sad thing. Because, let me ask you another question, just as we're thinking about this, what is the church? Who is the church? You know, understand this, according to the scriptures, and we need to really let this sink in, the church is not a building. The church is not a facility. The church is not a location. The great thing about the church is that the church is the, what we call the body of Christ. The church is made up of, of believers, followers of Jesus Christ. And so everywhere we go, the church goes with us. That's what's beautiful about the church. The church isn't something that you just go meet in once a week. Or for some people, two or three times a year, right? The church is something that we are. It is alive. The church is you. The church is me. We are the church. The Bible says that the New Testament teaches, Paul teaches this, the scriptures teach that, the, that we are called the body of Christ. That the church is the body of Christ. What does that mean? I mean, think about this. How are we the body of Christ? How am I the body of Christ? Am I literally Jesus' body? Well, obviously not, because I do not have nail-pierced hands, right? Or nail-pierced feet. We say these things, but what do these things truly mean? And oftentimes, for many believers, for many Christians, it's just cliche. Well, we're the body of Christ. Well, what does it mean to be the body of Christ? What does that literally mean? What, did, what, is, what is Paul trying to emphasize when he says to myself and you and each one of us, the church collectively, that we are his body? Body. What does that mean? What does that look like? How are we the, really the body of Jesus Christ? Let me ask you, is Jesus Christ physically here, physically here on earth? Yes or no? No, he's not physically here. But in essence, he is. You say, well, how can that be? If Jesus is not physically here, how is he physically here? He is because the Bible says that you are his body. I am his body. That means that although Jesus has left earth and he's seated at the right hand of the Father, he sent his Holy Spirit, and we'll, we'll, we'll be studying this the weeks to come, but his Spirit, as he told us here, will empower us. For example, Mark 16, 15 says, Go, go into all the world and preach the good news. Preach the gospel. Go into all the world and preach the gospel. The book of Acts says this, you shall receive power. Acts 1.8. He says, you will receive power. And after that, the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. 
So you're going to receive this Holy Spirit. He says, and you shall be witnesses unto me. You will be a witness of me. And he says, in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria. And he says, and then unto the uttermost, everywhere, into all the world, you're going to take this good news. You're going to take this gospel. So what does it look like? How are we his hands? How are we his feet? How are you and I the body of Christ? It is that. It is just that. We are his feet. We are the feet of Jesus. We are the hands of Jesus. We are the voice, if you will, of Christ to this lost world. Does that make sense? How else, you understand, Jesus left physically. He said, I'm sending my spirit to you. And with my spirit, the Holy Spirit that will empower you, 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 the church, will be me. You will be me. I mean, folks, think about this. That's awesome. Because everywhere we go, we take the church with us. When you walk into the dental office to get your root canal, you're taking Jesus with you. Somebody say amen. I'm like, Jesus, take the wheel, you know. <laughs> take, the, take the pain, you know. But when you walk into the dental office and you sit in that chair... How you conduct yourself, how you carry yourself, when you're in conversation, the things that we say, the things that we do, everywhere that we go, when you go and you volunteer to help the poor and the needy, and you go to caring ministries, you are being his hands, the hands of Jesus. You are being the feet of Jesus. When you are, wherever it is that you go, whether it's at work, whether it's in the, at the gas station, everywhere we go, we are his church, we are his body, and we are representing Christ to those who do not know him. It's an awesome thing. It's a privilege. So the Bible tells us, and, and, and clearly it says there's this commission. The last words of Jesus, the last message that he has for his disciples, before he ascends into heaven, he says this, I want you to go and take the gospel. Go and teach all nations. Multiply yourselves. Go and, and reproduce yourselves. I have given you this gospel. Now you take the gospel, and I want you to multiply. I want you to go and produce other other believers and train them to do the same, to be obedient and to follow the teachings that I have left you. So let's answer a couple questions this morning when we think about this great commission. The first thing I want to ask you is just simply this. He says to take the gospel. He says go and take the gospel into all the world. So we have to really understand, we have to come to grips of what is the gospel. What is the gospel. Now I'm not going to ask anyone to speak up this morning, but if someone were to say to you, well the Bible says, I mean Jesus says take the gospel into all the world. Well what is that? If someone were to say to you, what is the gospel? How would you respond? What is the gospel? Do we even know what the gospel really is? Now think about this. The Bible says this. When you look at each book, for example, it'll say the gospel according to to Matthew. The gospel according to Mark. The gospel according to Luke. The gospel according to John. They are called the gospels. What is that? What is the gospel? It's amazing, but many people, many of us, we, we sit in church every week. We use these terms. We say the church is the body of Christ. It sounds good, but we don't really think about what that really means. We say, we're, what are we here to do? Well, we're here to take the gospel into all the world. Well, what's the gospel? Well, uh, well, what is the gospel? If someone were to say to you, what is the gospel? What, would, what is that? How would we respond? Now, I trust that many of us know. Maybe some of us were put on the spot. We go, man, well, what it, you know, really, if I were to really simplify it, what is the gospel? The Bible tells us, in 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4, we won't turn there, but Paul says this, I'm going to declare to you, I'm going to tell you what the gospel is. And it's interesting because he says basically the same thing that the gospel according to Matthew and Mark and Luke and John say. This is the gospel. You ready? Here's the gospel. I'm going to add to it a little bit. 
Because when you think about the gospel according to Matthew, the gospel according to Luke, the gospel according to Mark and John, here's what the gospel is. In 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4, Paul says the gospel is the death of Christ, the burial of Christ, and the resurrection of Christ. But let me just add to this just for a moment and say this, that when we think about the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, what are they? What, what are they about? What are they writing about? They are li- writing about the life of Jesus Christ, right? His life. Why is his life so important? I'll tell you why his life is so important. Because when we think about this Gospel, and we think about who Christ is, we realize that his life, he demonstrated that he was God in the flesh. When he performed the miracles, he was demonstrating who he is. You see, that is so important because he lived a perfect life. He was without sin. He had to live this perfect life. He had to be tempted just like you were tempted, tempted just like I w- I'm tempted, He had to go through everything we went through, and yet the Bible says he did it perfectly. He did it without sin. How did he do that? He did that because it is not his nature to sin, because Jesus Christ was God in the flesh. Somebody bear witness there. You see, his life is important because he demonstrated who he is. In the miracles that he performed, the life that he lived... That even though he was persecuted and beaten and mocked, and listen, when they were ripping his beard out, the Bible says that he he demonstrated love. Who else can do that other than God? God is love. Who else could do that? Someone pulls in front of me. I'll be honest, I get road rage sometimes. Are you with me? Jesus was was whipped and beaten and persecuted. Everything that they did to him, as Jesus hung upon the cross, as he looked out and as he hung there, as the blood was dripping from his body, the flesh literally hanging off of his bone, he looks out and he says, Father, forgive them. Forgive them for they know not what they do. Listen to me. That is God. No man could do that. That is God. That is why the thief on the cross, when he saw and heard the words of Christ, he said, this is no other man than the God man. He says, will you remember me when you go into your kingdom? Because what he saw was that this truly was the son of God. Even the Roman centurion, the Roman soldier who was in charge of putting Jesus Christ to death, when he saw the the, the spirit of Christ, when he saw that he was different. Do you understand the Roman guard, the Roman soldier, the centurion, the one who was in charge of execution, probably executed hundreds and thousands of individuals. But when he saw the death of Christ... He said, there is no other death like this death. He said this, when he saw the the sky darken and the earth shake, he said, truly, this was the Son of God. You see, the gospel is the life, the death, the burial, and praise the Lord, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We serve a risen Savior. So what is the gospel? It's the life, the ministry, it's the life, death, burial, but praise God, it's the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He is alive. What do we call the gospel? Some of you may know. It's called the what? Good news. It's called the good news. That's good news. Amen? The gospel is good news. Why is it good news? Why is the gospel the good news? Let me tell you, in order for there to be good news, there's usually what? Bad news. You want to hear the bad news? I don't think I'd have to try very hard to convince all of us. The bad news is, you're a sinner. Well, Pastor Joe, you're being judgmental. No, I'm a sinner. You know what the bad news is? We've all sinned. The Bible says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The Bible says that we are all filthy, rotten scoundrels. Well, no, I'm not. Oh, yes, you are. I am too. You know, want to know something? If you really knew what I was like, you would not even walk through that door to come hear me speak. That is for sure. 
But you want to know something? If I really knew what you all were like, I wouldn't stand up here and waste my time. (laughs) Because the fact of the matter is, we're all sinners. We all say things we shouldn't say. We all do things we shouldn't do. Listen to me. The Bible says if we, if we broke just one law of God, then we're guilty of breaking all of them. You want to know something? I guarantee every single one of us has told at least one lie. The Bible says we're not supposed to lie. Even if we exaggerated something. Yeah, I went fishing and I caught a fish that big. We just lied. Did you take the cookie out of the cookie jar? Nope. I didn't do that. Even from a child, the Bible says, from an early age, you know something? We sin. You know what we're finding out? I'm finding out that my one-year-old, that perfect, precious little one-year-old, he is a sinner, let me tell you. He's starting to get his little temper and he wants to get his way. And all of a sudden, he starts throwing a fit. You want to know something? We did not sit down and teach him how to arch his back and how to throw a fit. No one taught him that. You know what's amazing? No one has taught my kids how to, how to, how to disobey. No one's taught my, you know, I don't sit down and say, now listen, I'm going to instruct you on how to lie. Now, when I ask you, did you take the cookie from the cookie jar? Be very convincing. Look at me now and shake your head and say, no, no, wasn't me. We don't have to teach them to do that. We have to teach them to do right. Why? Because we are all sinners by nature. We are born sinners. Are you with me? But the Bible says there is a punishment. There is a penalty. There is a price to pay for sin. For all have sinned. Come short of the glory of God. The Bible tells us this, there's a wage. There's something that we've earned because of sin. The wages of sin is death. It's separation from God. Now this is not something we all want to come to grips with. But you want to know something? If I got what I deserved, the moment I die, I deserve to die and be eternally separated from a holy God and I deserve to be paying the punishment, the penalty for my sin in a horrible place called hell. You know, everyone wants to believe in heaven and we do and praise God for it. It's a hope. It's a, it's a, I mean, it's a, I mean, we, heaven is a wonderful place. Amen. But can I say this? Just as much as there is a heaven, the Bible speaks of hell. Do you know that Jesus spoke about hell nearly three times as much as he did about heaven? The scripture tells us we know more about what what hell is like than we know. Heaven is a mystery to us. We know very little about what heaven is really like. To be in the presence of God and what it's going to look like. We know very little. I can tell you this. You study your Bibles and you just casually read through the Bible. I can tell you a whole lot more about hell than I can about heaven. You see, hell is a literal place. It is a real place. And you want to know something? I deserve to go there. You deserve to go there. Every single person. That's where we deserve to go. That's, 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 that's what we have to pay for. I don't know about you, but we sang it earlier. I'm thankful that Jesus Christ was willing to come, live a perfect life, To be our substitute. Amen. To live a perfect life. To go to the cross. To die on that cross. To be buried. But he praised the Lord on Sunday morning. That's why we're here. Because we're celebrating every Sunday that Jesus Christ is alive. That he is risen. Jesus Christ is risen and he is alive. He took my sin and put it upon himself. The Bible says it like this. He, speaking of Christ, who knew no sin, he became sin. He took my sin upon himself. He took my punishment. He took my penalty for my sin. He came in, if you will, and said, I will take it upon myself. I will take it upon myself. I have paid that price so that you can go free. I don't know about you, but that is good news. Are you with me? That's the good news. So what is the gospel? Or what does it mean? People say, as a church, we need to be evangelistic. The word evangel is the same word as the word gospel. It means good 
news. Jesus says this, I want you believers, I want you my church to go and tell the good news. Tell people what Jesus Christ has done. Tell people that they do not have to pay their own penalty for sin, that it's already been paid for, that Jesus Christ paid for it. I don't know about you, it's rarely happened, but isn't it nice when you go somewhere? Just recently, a good friend did this for us, and when we go and you stand in line, you're going to get something to eat, and as you're standing there, all of a sudden the bill comes up, and you're getting ready to pay, and the other person says, hey, I got this, I'm going to pay for this. I don't know about you, but that's good news, amen? Amen. It's foolish, you know, and sometimes you say, no, 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 I got it, I got it. Deep down, you're like, yeah, <laughs> you know? When someone else says, hey, I'm going to pay for it, I've got this, and we say, thank you. Can I say something? That's, I know that's in a very light scale, but gee, that's what Jesus did for us. He said, I got this, I did this, I've paid it in full, I've paid for it. That is the good news. That's great news. That's awesome news. Amen? And then he says this in Acts 1.8. He says, I want you to be witnesses. You will be witnesses. So the two things that we're just mainly talking about today that we really want to grasp is what is the gospel? So let's, before we move on, what is the gospel? The gospel is what? We could say it like this. It's the life, all right? And it's the death the burial and resurrection of Christ. That is good news. Why is it good news? Because he became our substitute. He paid the penalty of sin for us. That is good news. And may I say this, the world needs to hear the good news. Now, what does it mean to be a witness? All right, we say, well, we need to be a witness. Jesus said that you're going to receive the Holy Spirit and then you're going to be witnesses. You're going to be my witnesses to this, to this earth, to those, to all creatures, you know, far and wide. You will be my witnesses. What does it mean to be a witness? What does that look like to be a witness? What is a witness? Well, let's look at it like this. Think about a courtroom. Someone calls someone into the courtroom And they're called in to do what? To be a witness or they might say, we're going to swear you in to what? Testify. You're going to have to testify. You are to be a witness. Now, a witness, in essence, here's just a very simple way of looking at it. A witness just tells what he knows. A witness tells what he's seen. A witness tells what he has heard. Let's go back to this. The gospel according to Matthew. What is Matthew doing? Matthew is just simply telling what he had seen and what he had heard. He's telling the good news. He was a witness. The gospel according to Mark. The gospel according to Luke. The gospel according to John. You know what they were simply doing? They were testifying or they were a witness to the life and ministry, the death, the burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. They were just telling people the good news. They just told people what they had seen. And Jesus says this. He says to all of his disciples, you will be my witnesses. You shall be my witnesses. He commissions us. He says, listen, you are to be my witness. So what does that mean? What is, what is a witness? And I think we sometimes complicate. We complicate sharing our faith. We complicate being a witness. Being a witness does not mean that you have to memorize the entire Bible. And that you have to know, you know, that you, ha- you know, and, and don't, don't take this wrong. I'm all for apologetics. And, you know, you know how there's a, they call them apologetics. I'm, 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 I apologize, but I don't know about being apologetic. But how many of you have ever heard of the term apologetics? They're the people who do all this really deep study, and then they start going into all the scientific reasons, and they can start naming like this star and that star and how it navigated, and I'm like, oh my goodness, and I'm like more confused by the time they're done. And then they start going into the creation versus evolution, and they start going into all this stuff, and I'm like, well, I don't know all that stuff about creation and evolution, and I'm not a scientist, and I have no clue. I barely got out of chemistry and biology, you know. And so, don't take me wrong. I I like those guys. They're great. But sometimes what we think that we have to be able to do that in order to be a witness. To be a witness, you simply just tell what you know. And tell and share what you have seen and what you have heard. It reminds me of the man in the Bible who was blind and Jesus healed him. 
And they came and the Pharisees and everyone was upset. And they said to him, you know, is this the son of God? And who is this man? And what do you think? And the guy literally said this, and I quote, he says, I don't know who he is. All I know is I once was blind, but now I see. They got mad at him and they're like, you know what? You know, we're going to, you can't say that and you can't do that. But everybody knew it. He was blind from birth. His, everyone in the community knew that he was blind. And when he encountered Jesus, that Jesus healed the man and now he can see. You know, in essence, spiritually speaking, that's what we are as witnesses. We just simply tell people, hey, this is my life. This was my life before Jesus. This is my life after Jesus. This is what Jesus has done in my life. That's a witness. Pretty simple. A witness just tells what he's experienced. Shares with people what he has heard, what he has seen. That's what Matthew did. That's what Mark did. That's what Luke did. That's what John did. The Gospels are simply men being a witness of what they saw, what they heard. What was demonstrated, being a witness. You and I are called to be a witness. When someone gets called to the courtroom and they're asked to be a witness, they just tell what they've seen and what they have heard. They may call numerous witnesses and try to collaborate what's going on. If you've ever seen an accident happen and the officer comes and, you know, there's all this twisted metal and they come and you just tell them, the officer says, uh, I need a witness. And so they'll take your statement. You're just telling them what you've seen and heard. Can I say this? That is what we are called to do as Christians, as believers. Do you know something? We are all a witness every day about something. I had a horrible tooth, tooth, toothache and tooth thing. And I'm like, I need a dentist. And I had two or three people give me options and which one to go to and who to go to. You know what they were doing? They were saying, hey, this was my experience. I went to this dentist and this is what happened. And I had a good, you know, and they were being a witness. And they're saying, go here. Hey, how many of you ever done this? Uh, Food. We all are a witness to food. Have you ever had this pizza? Oh, it's the best pizza in Tucson. I don't know what the best pizza in Tucson is yet. I'll have to wait and see. Anybody have any suggestions? Mama's pizza, see? Brooklyn pizza, there you go. See, he's being a witness. Well, how do you know? Well, because I've tasted it, and that's my favorite. We've all done it. Have you ever ate this? Have you ever had that? Have you ever tried this? And we'll talk to people about that. Now, I'm going to tell you something. I, I'm from the East Coast. I'm a Philadelphia cheesesteak hoagie eating machine. I love Philly cheesesteaks. And so I'll get in a conversation with people. I'm like, so what's your favorite food? Or if I'm with a group of wrestlers, I'll say, hey, have you ever had a Philly cheesesteak? No, what's that? I said, well, it's that. It's, it's steak and cheese on a bun. I don't know. If that, I don't know if that. I'm like, don't knock it till you tried it. It is awesome. It's amazing. And so whenever we're near a place that they have them, they are hooked. Now they're like, hey, coach, let's go get a Philly cheesesteak hoagie, right? How about people like Cane's or they like Chick-fil-A, you know, closed on Sunday filet, you know? Chick-fil-A, you know what happens? Word of mouth. People, it spreads. People say, oh, it's amazing. It's great. It's wonderful. You want to know something? How many times have you gotten a good deal or a good sale because someone said, hey, I got this. It was 50% off. Hey, American Eagles having a 40% off back to school sale. Everybody's like, oh, I am there, right? What are we doing? We're bearing witness of something we've seen, something we've heard. So let's be honest, some good news. Hey, this is good news. There's a sale going on. There's a back to school sale or whatever it may be. We're testifying. We're saying, hey, here's some good news. Why is it that we can share the good news about a sale, about our favorite food, but oftentimes we don't share the good news of Jesus Christ? Come on. I'll tell you why. Spiritual warfare. Right? We talk about so many other things. It's easy to talk about all the other things. But oftentimes it's difficult because the enemy is constantly battling us. Jesus says this, that we are to be his witnesses. I mean, we do it all the time. People say, hey, 
Have you seen this movie? It just came out. You haven't seen it yet? You got to check it out. I've already heard, you got to go check out Spider-Man. It's the new Spider-Man. Go check it out. You know what we're doing? We're being a witness. Or how many times I'm saying, oh, that movie, don't, don't even waste your time. Don't even spend your money on the ticket, right? The point is, that's what being a witness is. We as believers, sharing what Christ is doing in our life, finding ways to let people know, hey, there's good news. I have a question for you. You ready? We're almost done. Do people that have constant contact with you know that you are a follower of Jesus? Do people in your life that you're in, what I would say constant or consistent, people that see you once a week or once a month or twice a month or the person you work with? Now, listen to the wording carefully. Do they know that you are a follower of Jesus Christ. Now listen to what I did not say. And please don't take offense to this. Many people say, well they know I go to church. Uh uh. Because there's all kinds of things that are called church. And lots of people go to church. But not everyone that goes to church is a follower of Jesus Christ. Come on. Do people you come in communication with and contact with, do they know that you are a follower of Jesus Christ. That is, in essence, what we're here to do. Why did the Lord leave us here? He left us. He could have just taken us to heaven, but he says, I've left you because I want you to share the good news. I want you to communicate to others what Christ has done for you in your life. I like this. In our Wednesday study, one of the quotes about evangelism, and uh, he, he comes this area every so often. Dennis Prather says this. I love this. Listen to this definition. I'll say it twice. Just let it sink in. People say, well, what is evangelism? His definition is this. Evangelism is leaving a person that I have met with a better understanding of God than they would have if they never met me. Did you hear that? What is evangelism? Evangelism is leaving a person I have met with a better understanding of God than they would have if they never have met me. I think that pretty much sums it up. Everybody that we come in contact with, now I'm not saying it's, but people that we're, that God has put into our life, that people put across our path, we should be praying and seeking and desiring to share the good news. It's amazing. We will talk about our favorite food. We'll share that good news. We'll talk about the best sale. We'll talk about the movie. But the good news of the gospel, there is no better news than the gospel of Jesus Christ. There's no better news than that. And we are called, he says, his last words to his church, he says, church, I call you, I commission you to take the good news. You know what? School's getting ready to start. The kids at school, do they know you're a follower of Jesus? The people at work, do the people around you know that you're a follower of Christ? Here's a challenge. It's hard. Busy life, busy world. Do our neighbors know that we're a follower of Jesus Christ? As a coach, do my athletes know that I'm a follower of Jesus Christ? Am I leaving them when they come in contact and they spend time with me? Am I leaving them with a better understanding of who God is? When you're at work, do the people around you have a better understanding of who God is than if they've never met you? And if not, then we are not fulfilling what God has called us to do. We are not truly being the witnesses that he has called us to be. But I tell you this, we have the good news. If you're here and you've believed upon Jesus Christ and you've received that good news, we have that good news. What a tragic shame it would be for us to keep that good news and to not share it. We are called, Jesus said, if you, you have received that good news, you've accepted that good news, it is our responsibility to take the good news and to witness, to testify, to share that. And uh, that is our commission. That is our call. That is why we're here. Now we're going to talk in the weeks to come on how to do it. 
and, and how to be equipped and, and ways to do these things. And we're going to talk about why. Why is it so important? We're going to talk about all those things in the weeks to come. But most importantly, we're done this morning, but here's the question. Number one, what is the gospel? It's the life, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. That is the good news. Amen? That's the good news. That's good news, right? Good news? All right. And then he says, I want you to be a witness. Just tell people what God's doing in your life. Leave people with a better understanding of who God is than if they never met you. That's pretty simple. We can do that, right? I can do that. You can do that. Find ways. Find opportunities that the people that come into your life. If you know people and the big people in your life for months and months and months and they do not even know that you are a follower of Jesus Christ, you, here's it, I, this is strong, you and I, if I do that, I am dropping the spiritual ball and I am not fulfilling what God has left me here to do. Teenagers, if you're at school and there's kids that you hang out with and spend time with and they don't even know that you're a follower of Jesus, you are not fulfilling what God has called you to do. College student, you're not fulfilling what God has called you to do. At work, coach, we are not fulfilling what God has called us to do. As a neighbor, we're not doing what God has called us to do. We are dropping the spiritual ball and we are called. This is our calling. This is our commission. Last words of Jesus. I don't know about you, but the last words that he tells us are probably pretty important. Wouldn't you agree? Probably the most important. This is the last message that he has for us. His last will and testament, so to speak. Go, go and take the gospel. Take the good news. If you're here and you do not know Jesus Christ as your Savior, you don't know him, I'll tell you today, receive him. Believe upon him. Accept him. Accept that good news. He paid the price for you. And if you have, the Bible says, follow him in obedience. Be baptized. We're looking forward here in the near future to be baptizing once again. And if you have not been baptized, what a great opportunity. If that's something you would like to talk about, talk with me after church, after service about that. So you know what? That's something I want to do. I want to identify with Christ. We would be honored. We'd be excited. Because that is a great commission. To follow Christ, to be baptized, and then to go out and take the good news. Let's pray.